Thank you for the introduction. So I am Evelina and I'll be talking about two things today. I'll be talking about what I do as my research, which will be the clustering of cancer data with Bayesian non-parametrics. And then I will talk about how I do it, and that will be the F-sharp part. So I am currently doing a PhD at the University of Cambridge, and right now I'm in Prague to write up my thesis. So I thought this is a nice opportunity to drop by and do a talk here. Okay, so some background on my research. Uh, first of all, I am not a biologist, I don't have any medical training, but I'm working with cancer data. So this is just some intuition about what I'll be talking about. Uh, currently, uh, when you have some kind of medical problem and you go to a doctor, this is the standard way that it works. Uh, the doctor makes some diagnosis and then you will get prescribed a medicine. And in the standard way, in the traditional medicine, everyone gets the same treatment. But in, in reality, it doesn't work like that. Because people are different, different medicines work for different people, and also not all diseases are the same. For example, with cancer, there are many different types. I work with breast cancer data, and there are several different types of breast cancer. Some can kill you very quickly, and it's very difficult to treat. And some other types, you can live happily for many years without much treatment at all. So what we really want is to find groups of people and apply specific treatments to them. So this is something called precision medicine. The older term is personalized medicine. But really, it's not about individual persons. It's about finding groups of people and find the treatment that works for them. So cancer is a very difficult subject. It's a very complex process. I will take you through this diagram in detail. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm just joking. Uh, this is just a glimpse of our current understanding of signaling pathways in cancer. You can see that it's very, very complex. Uh, there are many things going on, and this is just a very high-level view. Uh, and if we look at specific data that we can measure from tumor samples, we get just one view over this process. So you can see that by looking at specific nodes in this diagram, we can't determine much. So I'm getting closer to what I'm doing as my research, and that's something called integrative clustering. Uh, when a patient comes to a doctor, the doctor diagnoses them with cancer, and then they can take a sample from the tumor and do a biopsy. That means take a piece of the tumor and analyze it. And they can measure what genes are doing in the tumor sample, they can measure what genes are being blocked, which means uh, they are not being active. They can look at proteins that are being produced in cancer cells. And every single one of these data types gives us one view over the complex process. And what my research is on is how to cluster these different data types together. Because I guess you don't have much background in biology either. I will just switch this. <laughs> we can look at them as simple data. But each of these data groups, they have different types. So we can't really put them together and cluster them together as if it was one big data vector. We have to analyze them separately, but also uh, we would like to assume something about like, a connection between different data types. For example, if uh, two tumor samples get clustered together in one data type, we would like them to be more likely to be clustered in the other as well. Does it make sense still? So what I'm working on is basically fancy clustering. Uh, has anyone used Bayesian non-parametrics here? Okay, so I will do a very light introduction because this is quite a mathematically heavy field, but standard parametric models that I guess you all used or are using now, uh, they 
you can imagine, for example, clustering with k means. So k means assumes there are k clusters in your data, and then you just basically separate your data into those k clusters. So that's something called a parametric model, because we assume that there is some finite set of parameters that describe your data fully. So if you are looking at, I wrote it probability, so this will be a probabilistic model. So if you are looking at the probability of x given data and some parameters, it will be equal to the probability of x given just those parameters, because those parameters describe your data completely. But I guess you can see that this is not a very realistic assumption. Even though these models are usually quite simple to fit, they, if you don't have well-behaved data, they can be quite clumsy. And it can be quite hard to find where your assumptions about the parameters are violated if you are working, for example, with very high dimensional data. So I am working with non-parametric models. And those models, well, they are called non-parametric, but that doesn't mean that they don't have any parameters. In fact, they usually have an infinite number of parameters. Ooh, scary, right? How do you fit an infinite model? Is it even possible? The thing is that in your data, you don't have infinite number of data points. So in your data, only a finite subset of the model will be basically manifested, which makes them trackable. And the key thing is that the complexity of your model adapts together with the data. Uh, if I go back to the k-means algorithm, if we start with k equals five, and we think, oh, there are just five clusters in my data, and I'm sure of it, then over time, something might change, and you will need more clusters and more. So that's something that the non-parametric models can give us. They are able to adapt to the complexity in your data uh, as the data come. And for clustering, I'm using something called a Dirichlet process. Uh, one, probably the simplest way how to look at the Dirichlet process is that it's a limit of a finite mixture model. For example, do you know Gaussian mixture models? That's basically a probabilistic version of something like k-means. So this is just an example of a Gaussian mixture model where we have data points generated from three Gaussian distributions. And this is a way how you write down a probabilistic model uh, mathematically. So now a probability of a data point will be a sum over the probability of data points given the corresponding mixture times its mixture weight. And the mixture weight is just a prior probability that the data point belongs to any of those clusters. And important thing is that these pi k's sum to one. And now we can take a limit of this process for k going to infinity, and we will get something called a Dirichlet process mixture. And the mixing proportions, the pi's, will still sum to one. We'll just get an infinite sum. For me, the easiest way how to look at a Dirichlet process is something called a Chinese restaurant process. If you go in more into Bayesian non-parametrics, you will find out that people use these nice metaphors, like a Chinese restaurant. There is also an Indian buffet process. But a Chinese restaurant process is a way of sampling from a Dirichlet process. Uh, if you have been to a large Chinese restaurant, they usually have a seemingly infinite number of tables and people come all the time and they have different number of people sitting at each table. And this is one of the ideas behind this process. Basically, right now, every table in this restaurant will be a cluster. And customers will be our data points coming into clusters. So, when the first customer comes into the restaurant, he gets seated at the first table. And the table represents a cluster, and each cluster has some parameters. For example, with the Gaussian mixture model, 
the theta would be the mean and covariance of the cluster. So we have the first customer and we have some parameters. And when the nth customer comes into the restaurant, uh, here is the fancy bit, uh, he gets to sit at some table with, uh, diff with pr different probabilities. Uh, he gets seated at a table where people are already sitting with the probability proportional to the number of people sitting at the table already. And there is a possibility he gets seated at an empty table with probability proportional to some constant alpha. So this gives us basically the potentially infinite number of clusters because there is always some probability that a new coming customer or data point gets assigned to a completely new cluster if he doesn't fit to any of those uh, pre-existing clusters well enough. And also another thing is that uh, because the new customer gets seated to a table proportion with probability proportional to the number of people already sitting there, uh, that means that larger clusters will get more popular over time. This is the rich gets richer property. So this is a slightly more formal uh, way of defining a Dirichlet process. And we always write that G is uh, distributed according to a Dirichlet process with a concentration parameter alpha. That's the probability of opening a new cluster. And with some base measure H, which is uh, some probability distribution that defines our parameters for clusters. Means here these thetas are drawn from H. And that's basically the full definition of a Dirichlet process. There is some more mathematics behind it because the Chinese restaurant process is just one way of sampling from that. But uh, I think this will be enough for my purposes for now. Is everything clear? You can ask questions uh, throughout the talk. So because I am working on integrative clustering where I can't really compare the different data types together, uh, but I want to cluster them together. Uh, I will do something with the cluster parameters. Now the dishes at the table. What we can do is that we can expand these uh, so that we get one different parameter for each different data type. So now every table will have not just one like cluster parameter, it will have four different ones. You can view it as a, like a set menu in a Chinese restaurant where you get a starter and a main and a dessert and a second dessert. Uh, but this basically gives me the whole clustering structure. I can still cluster the data, but I don't uh, have to compare them directly. All I need to do is just to specify a probabilistic distribution for each data type separately. So this is quite an elegant way of treating this problem. So I won't go into too much detail. I will just show you some results where this type of approach can lead to. So this is something called a survival curve. Because for my cancer data, uh, they come from real patients and the patients were observed for up to 15 years and they were recording when the patient died or when the patient dropped out of the study. And the survival curve shows uh, we have probability of survival on this uh, axis and a time in years on this axis. So what it shows us is uh, how many patients are alive in the whole cohort at a specific time. So you can see that uh, after 10 years, basically half of the patients die, which is not very optimistic. But when I run my fancy clustering algorithm, I can get survival curve for every cluster. Now, 
the data I fed into the clustering algorithm are just the genomic and proteomic data that I showed you before. So the algorithm doesn't have any idea about the patients and their sur survival. But you can see that now different clusters have very different survival curves. And for example, here, this is a cluster where almost, well, basically no one died in 10 years. So this cluster has very different survival probability than, for example, this cluster, where we got to 50% survival after five years. So you can see that this kind of approach really leads to something. And now uh, what people what, uh, can do is to look at uh, which genes are important in each different cluster and how we can basically target some of these and maybe knock out some cancer genes, things like that. So now I will get to a second part of my talk. Yes? Uh, in this case, uh, uh, I have Gaussians for all four of those. Those, they are normalized and they fit quite well with the Gaussian. But uh, right now I'm working with other data, data set as well, which is on breast cancer as well, but it has copy number variation data and those are discretized. That means I have just a multinomial there as well. I can add any distribution in there. I did some experiments with time series data where I used uh, another type of Bayesian non-parametric model, which is a Gaussian process. So this model doesn't restrict uh, your data distribution in any way. Yes? Yes? Yeah, well, yes, yes. Uh, well, in survival curves, whenever you have a step down, it means someone died. And whenever there is a tick, like this, can you see them? That means someone dropped out of the study. That means uh, by the end, there is no one left in the cluster. This blue cluster is relatively small. But for example, these clusters that are here, probably up to this point, they have quite a lot of people so in them. There is no cluster of people. There is just one, one guy or one woman. So. Well, one thing with a Dirichlet process clustering is that, um, yeah, because you have always a non zero probability of opening a new yeah. cluster. Uh, and the way I'm fitting the Dirichlet process is, th is through Gibbs sampling. That means in every sample I get a new realization of the process. I do get some clusters where I have only one person. But then if you summarize it over more samples, then those clusters disappear. Any other questions to the first part of the talk? Yes. Uh, this data set has just uh, 500 patients, which is relatively small. And that's another thing you get in Bayesian models for free. They don't overfit because they account for uncertainty. And they have like, automatic uh, relevance determination, which means uh, the models that are too complex to model the data have smaller probability than the models that have about the right number of parameters or number of components to fit the data. That's something you get when you move into the Bayesian framework. <laughs> Any other questions before I move on? Yes. When you open a new cluster, I guess you reassign or reassign data, or don't you? No, no. 
when I open a new cluster, uh, well, a new cluster is open just when, well, there are two different things. One is the sampling process, uh, which I showed you before. And the other thing is how to do actually like inference in the model. And when I'm in the model, I always like, take one person out of the restaurant and then I look at all tables in the restaurant and uh, with some probability I open a new cluster. And that person stays at the cluster alone. But then I take another person out of the model and then I reassign that person again. And that person can get assigned to that cluster or it can get assigned to a new cluster. Um, usually inference in Bayesian models is more complex than in standard parametric models. But if you are interested, there is also a very nice algorithm called the DP means algorithm, which is something like K means only derived from the Dirichlet process. And it's very efficient. And yes, it determines the number of uh, clusters automatically. You can discuss that later. So, now, a little about how I do this kind of modeling. Uh, I guess if you are doing machine learning or data science, you are using one of these languages. Uh, are you using anything else in your daily work? Anyone? <laughs> uh, yes, we all use scripting languages because they are very easy to use and very, it's very quick to write down any algorithm we need. Um, I was using all of them before, and then I moved on to something called functional programming. Uh, what does this mean when you write it down in Python or R? Well, this means that you are incrementing a variable, right? Easy. Does it make sense in mathematics? Is there any x such that it would equal x plus one? No. <laughs> It doesn't make sense in mathematics. But it makes sense uh, in functional programming, where our variables are treated basically like mathematical variables. And they are immutable, which means once you assign a value to them, they will have this value. So they are very nice for writing mathematics. And they are very nice for reasoning about your code as well. For example, this is a function. Uh, if you ever need to sum uh, exponentials and take a logarithm of that, this is like an efficient way to do that because you avoid all overflows and underflows. Anyway, this is just a mathematical expression. And when we read that, we look at the data, xi, and then we basically move in this direction. Because we subtract x, then we take the exponential, then we sum the data, then we apply a logarithm, and then we apply summation with a constant. This is a piece of F-sharp code. Uh, and you can see this is something called the pipe operator which the only thing that it does is that it takes an argument on one side and applies, puts it as an input into a function here. So this basically takes the data, uh, applies some function to them, then it sums the data, then it applies a logarithm, and then it uh, adds a value. So this is a very natural way of thinking about your code. If you are using R, R has this as well. They copied it from F sharp. Basically, it's in the Magritte R uh, package. And the only thing that it does is that it takes an argument and applies it as a first argument to a function. Uh, in F sharp, it gets passed as the last argument. And this is something called carrying in functional languages. 
but we don't have to deal with that. Uh, have you seen code like this? <laughs> I guess you might have. This is uh, from a problem I was dealing with a month ago. Uh, this is a package that I didn't write. This is in R, and it had a bug in it. <laughs> <laughs> And as you can see, all variables are just like single letter. And there is a lot of like, uh, square brackets. But if you are working with R, uh, it can be either a vector or a matrix or a list or a data frame or an array. And they are all accessed in the same way. So unless you actually go through the code from the beginning and find out what's in each variable, you have no idea what's going on. Uh, in F-sharp, it's a statically typed language, which means that everything has a type, and you can get tooltips on everything. That means this is quite a complex piece of code, but when I hover my mouse over anything, it will give me uh, like details of the function. For example, this gives me like, types of all parameters that I need to pass in which helps a lot. Another example is uh, I had a problem. I had to s use uh, adaptive rejection sampling for something. And I was looking around the internet for some working implementation. And I couldn't find any. Because for my function that I wanted to sample from, they all contained some bugs. and. Uh, this is, I won't talk about the actual algorithm, but it was dealing with uh, hulls over likelihood functions. So this is just a function, and this is something called the lower hull. It's a convex hull. And I had to sample from that. And uh, I found some quite working uh, implementation in MATLAB. It was uh, like a supplementary code to one machine learning textbook. And this is like a standard MATLAB code. Uh, what it does is that it basically takes the value x, and if it's uh, located here, it will assign minus infinity to the value of the lower hull. If it's in this region, it will get minus infinity as well. And if it's in here, it, we just find the interval where the x is located and assign a value of the lower hull in there. Fairly standard. Uh, there was some bug in the MATLAB code, and I was looking for it by rewriting it into F-sharp. So this is how it looks when I rewrote it into F-sharp, actually. You see that uh, I created something called uh, pattern matching, or active pattern in F-sharp. It look, it's much more readable. You can immediately see what is going on. The complexity is still in there, but it's hidden somewhere else. Um, I will try to switch to my code. OK. This is the piece of code I was showing before. The complexity just moved into one other function, which is uh, here. This does basically the same thing the MATLAB version was doing, but I don't have to like, mix it together with the logic of the actual algorithm, which helps a lot when you are writing something. And also, what I get in F sharp is that, for example, if I forget one version of that, I will get an error which says, parser warning, incomplete pattern matches, which means that I forgot something. Which, when you are using something like this in a much bigger project, you always forget something. Or you add something, and then you forget it was there. And when I create like a general pattern match, it will also give me an error, and it will say this rule will never be matched. 
And this kind of behavior in a programming language prevents so many bugs. Okay, I will go back to my presentation. Yeah, when I was looking for the bug in MATLAB, turns out the bug was hidden inside uh, something like this, where they assigned a value within some if clause, but they forgot that uh, otherwise it should have a uh, value as well. So they basically forgot one part of the code, which uh, when I rewrite it in a functional way, I don't get this problem, because I can just take the value and assign uh, a result out of some bigger bunch of code. So I don't have a problem by forgetting to assign a value somewhere within, somewhere hidden. Uh, I guess you are all dealing with some real world data. This is just a screenshot from Twitter. It says uh, students in my class during the project proposal time we will solve computer vision. And when uh, they are supposed to present some results, they say, oh, we got stuck pre-processing data. I guess if you are working with some real world data, you get this sort of problem. Because the data are messy, you have to put them into some reasonable format. When you get data like I do from like, biological papers, it's very, very demanding to go through that and to explore the data and find out what's actually in there. So I will show you another part of F Sharp, which is called the type providers. And they basically give typed access to all sorts of things. For me, primarily, the most important ones are CSV files or JSON files. So I will show you how that works in reality. So this is just my F sharp code. And here I create a CSV type provider. And what it does is that I give it just some sample file. In this case, I'm giving it this file and it's a data file on uh, like survival information and clinical information on patients and you can see that I have gender, I have some a ER status, PR status, there's quite a lot of information in there and I will just show you how I can access it. Now, in the clinical info variable, I have all the rows in the table. And in every row, I get typed access to all information in that table, to all headers, everything. And it's a typed access. So I will know that, for example, days to the date of death should be probably an integer. Let's have a look. No, it's a floating point number. It gives me a sequence of floating point numbers. And for other variables, I will get a string, things like that. Also, another thing that really increases the legibility of the code is when you look at uh, the names of uh, the columns, which here are basically, they contain even the spaces. They are not converted into something more machine readable. Because when we use these two double backticks, we can use it in the code as a variable, as a variable name. So, do you think men can get breast cancer? Who thinks men can get breast cancer? 
Let's see if, they, if there are any men in my data set that can have that. I will again look at rows. And now I would like to get their gender. Gender, yes. Sorry, all those tooltips on the small screen, they get expanded. So let's have a look here. I just have. Beginning, it says female, female, female. So let's filter that. Okay, and I will take the length of the sequence. Okay, and you probably can't see that. And there are eight men. Actually, this is about 1% uh, of the whole data set are men, and they have breast cancer. So, no good news for you guys. <laughs> uh, another thing is, if I uh, accidentally, here I am comparing X with uh, like a string that says male. If I put, for example, a number in there, I will get an error that says, this expression was expected to have type string. I hope you can see that this really prevents a lot of bugs. Because for me, whenever I get my code into a form where I don't have any errors, that basically means it will run. Uh, sometimes I might have some like, bigger bugs in there that don't have anything to do with the type system, but that's usually about the logic of the program. Oh, another type of data I would like to show you is, for example, I have data on some other genetic indicators. I will just show you. This is a table which has uh, 30,000 rows. So it's quite big. Usually you don't want to explore this sort of table through opening it in Excel or something like that. For example, if I remember correctly, like older versions of Excel had a limit on the number of rows, the uh, 65,000. So this is like half of that. So you should, probably shouldn't open it in something like that. But here I have it loaded in my like, environment and I can look at it interactively the way I was looking at the clinical data before. So just to glimpse of the data. These are some data that are included in the table. Um, I will, I want to look at one specific gene, which is the gene that's associated with breast cancer. Actually, uh, I guess you have heard about Angelina Jolie having like, a double mastectomy because they identified a mutation in this specific gene and also one other gene. So if you have mutations in those, you have very, very high probability of getting breast cancer. Men do as well. And if men have this kind of mutation, they have higher probability of getting prostate cancer as well. So it's, luckily it's not very common to have this mutation. Um, but, uh, it's included in my data set, so I can have a look at uh, information of this, on this gene, it's BRCA2. So again, I can look at the row and look at all the data that I have in the table, and now there are many more variables, like location and probes, things like that. But if I want to see what kind of gene that is, I would usually have to go and take the identifier and look it up in some database. Uh, if you are working with bioinformatics, the way you, the place you would go would be probably the ensemble database, which for every gene, it gives you information where it is located, 
uh, what different transcripts it can have and genomic location, exons, entrons, things like that. Sorry, it's not loading. But what you usually get in databases is a REST-based API. Uh, and this is just for machine access into the database. And what they give you usually for like, different types of requests are example documents. So if I just click on it, this is just a JSON document uh, with all information that are available within the database on this specific gene. And what I can do is just take this address of this sample document and go back to my code and create something called a JSON type provider. It's here. Okay, now I, I have typed access to the database and all I gave it was really the web address of the example document here. Now I create a query into the database by putting in gene ID. And the gene ID is included in my CSV file. And now in this variable I have the JSON document that I got back from the database. And yeah, it's not very readable, right? And I can access it in the same way I could access uh, the CSV file. So I just type brca2 dot and I get all the information in the file. I don't have to look at the names of the variables, look, look at names of the items, and it's there. So I can look at the description and it says the breast cancer early onset. I can look at RCA2, let's say, species, and it's Homo sapiens. So, if I don't know what gene I'm looking at, I can always access the information. Uh, normally, I know in Python or in R, there are libraries that do that for you as well, but, well, Sometimes it's much easier to do something like this because all I did was I referenced an example document and then I pulled the data. Uh, it's much easier than actually going through some documentation and finding out how to access the data through some library. And if there is no library, well, I don't have any problems. I can, again, do the same thing. And again, my access to all the data is typed. That means that I know that the species will be a string. This also helps uh, in some areas. For example, I was doing some analysis of Twitter data and the Twitter IDs don't fit into an integer. But they do fit into an integer for people who open their Twitter account early. So if you are looking just at subset of some uh, accounts, you might be tempted to just deal, the, deal with them using an integer. But when you get a type provider to give you the access, it will tell you that it won't fit into one standard integer. And you get a type error if you try to compare it with one. Another thing I can access through type providers is R. Uh, you probably guess that I don't like R as a language very much, but uh, I can access any functions in R from F sharp. So that's basically the best of all worlds because R has something called Bioconductor, which is a huge library of uh, tools for bioinformatics. And all I need to do is type R dot and I get access to everything there is in R. And again, I get the typed access, so it's very easy to use. For example, uh, 
yeah, F Sharp runs on .NET or in this case on Mono, and there are no very good libraries for data access for sorry for plotting. So I can just use uh, ggplot from R. Ggplot. Mm. Here. For example, this is an age distribution from my clinical data on breast cancer. And yeah, I can just plot it using an R function. So I'm really using F sharp as like a scaffold around my work where I, it allows me to easily access data, pull them in, then maybe call some R function, and then use the data to visualize them, things like that. So to summarize, I gave you a talk with two parts. In the first part, I was talking about Bayesian non-parametrics. So I hope you got some idea how flexible those models are, because usually you can't assume that there is just one fixed set of parameters that you can use to model your data, especially when your data are not uh, well behaved. For example, some strangely shaped clusters that don't really fit into your framework. You can use Bayesian non-parametrics for that. Um, yeah, something I didn't talk about, there are some efficient inference algorithms for inference in those kind of models. Uh, and in the second part, I was talking about functional programming. So I hope you are at least tempted to have a look at functions and how you can use them. And F Sharp has really great tools for dealing with data and accessing external sources, including other programming languages. We are still working on like a Python type provider, and then I wouldn't have to leave F Sharp at all. Okay, so any questions? <laughs> yes. So I understand why you prefer functional languages. It's just true because every time it went through the type checker, it's almost every time. Okay. Yeah. But why do you choose F sharp instead of Haskell? Because as far as I know, there is much, much bigger community behind Haskell, much more libraries and everything like that. And I was thinking that just it's better option as far as I know. So do you have any arguments against or Well, I'm not aware of like a big machine learning community in Haskell. Okay. And yeah, Haskell doesn't have type providers which is quite a big thing for me because I don't have to like, open tables, look at data types. It's very easy to just pull them in and basically type providers make other data types like part of your programming language. Yes? No. Well, it's comparable to R or Python in general. Whenever I had something implemented in Python, it ran about the same as uh, in F sharp. Is it Python and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as it's, it is using the same virtual machine as C sharp, so it should basically be as fast as yes. C sharp when you write. That's another thing. F sharp is used quite a lot in uh, several hedge funds and banks in London, and they say that one quite big advantage is that uh, when like, their quants implement some algorithms, they don't have to pass them on to some developer team to rewrite them into something else. <laughs> <laughs> you can just compile it and run it. Because you can see, uh, you saw that it's a scripting language, but you can also compile the, the program and run it as a standalone, and then it gets all the like, uh, more efficient compiler, Optimizations. Yes. Well, there are efficient algorithms to use on that. And for example, I was talking about k-means, 
and there is some quite nice development in like, adapting Dirichlet processes to be more efficient. And um, I think it's a group around Mike Jordan in Berkeley that are working on something they called small variance asymptotics. Because you can get k-means from a Gaussian mixture model when you drive uh, variance to zero. And you can apply the same kind of approach to Bayesian non-parametric models as well. And then you get much more efficient, like, simple algorithms that you can use to do something similar to what uh, Bayesian non-parametric models do. I do know the number of clusters because I look at like posterior samples from my process. Well, uh, when you are you doing Bayesian inference, mm -hmm. uh, the standard way to do is uh, to do it is through something like Gibbs sampling or generally MCMC -MC sampling, where you produce samples from your model. And then you can summarize them. And that gives you basically an overview of the mean value of your model. And then you can look at the number of clusters. Yes? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, it is uh, a library called F Sharp Data that I just referenced here. Just basically load the library, and then the only thing I have to do is to provide some sample document. So in this case, it was either like a CSV table or the web-based uh, JSON document. Yes, it will basically load the document and look at the values in there. So if it's a CSV table, it will look at like values in the columns and then it will determine, oh, this is probably a floating point value, so this will get this type. Yeah, and then you can access it through this. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, it depends. Well, the data I am using, they have uh, the typical uh, data you get in bioinformatics. It means that I have about 500 patients, but uh, for each patient I, patient, I get gene expression, and that's a vector of length 700. <laughs> Then with microRNA expression, I think it's about 450. So, <laughs> so they are quite big. <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of data you get in bioinformatics. It's usually called the small n big P because you have like small number of uh, samples but a large dimensionality of the data. And yeah, it works just fine. But of course, you can make your data smaller by using some dimensionality reduction method. <laughs>